Good morning. Here's one of my helpers. This is Samantha, and she's a very big cat. And uh, sometimes you might hear her in the background. But today, I guess we uh, better get to lecture today. So go ahead down, Sam. Good girl. Today's lecture is going to be about weathering and erosion. We have to go over this because in the rock cycle that we talked about last time, rocks can get weathered and eroded into little bits and pieces that will then make a different rock type called sedimentary rocks. So before we can talk about those sedimentary rocks, we have to talk about how do we get those little bits and pieces that make up those rocks. And that's through weathering and erosion. So weathering is the physical and chemical breakdown of rock at or near Earth's surface. So this isn't one of those things that happens deep, deep underground. This is happening right here where we live on the surface. And you will often hear these terms weathering and erosion used together. Well, weathering is breaking apart the rocks. Erosion is then when those broken up bits and pieces get removed from a location. So first it gets broken apart, then those broken pieces get carried away somewhere. And there are two main types of weathering that exist. There's mechanical weathering, which some books will call physical weathering. And this is when rock is broken into smaller pieces without changing the composition. And um, so you might have a rock like this that has a lot of um, silica, a lot of quartz, and a lot of hematite in it. And if it gets mechanically weathered, you're just going to get more pieces of silica, quartz, and hematite, no chemical change, just from a big piece to smaller pieces. Now this is different from the chemical weathering, where there's actually going to be some sort of a chemical reaction in the rock that changes the minerals that are inside. There's going to be an actual um, uh, change in composition. This usually happens because the minerals will react with oxygen and water or other substances. So when we look at types of uh, mechanical weathering, we're going to start with that. There are a number of ways that rocks can get broken into smaller pieces without changing the composition. And a really common one in some parts of the world is called frost wedging. And uh, frost wedging occurs because water is a very special substance. Unlike most things that actually get smaller when they turn into a solid, because of water's crystal structure, when it freezes, it expands about 9% when it freezes. So if you have like a little crack in some rock right here, water gets into it, it freezes. As that ice expands, it's going to force that crack to open a little bit bigger. And then if this process repeats over and over again, that crack is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until we, uh, we end up actually breaking the rock in two. Now, of course, this is not going to happen everywhere on the planet. This is most effective in climates with lots of freeze-thaw cycles. So this is not one of those things that happens a lot around here. But there are these places that have what are known as temperate climates. And in temperate climates, you have these magical things called seasons, unlike here, where every season is hot. Well, in these temperate climates, especially in autumn and in springtime, you get um, days that are above freezing, but nights that are below freezing. And that means you have many of these freeze-thaw cycles going from liquid water to solid water to liquid to solid. That's going to, uh, each time that water freezes, it makes that little crack in the rock open just a little bit more. Now, very similar to frost wedging, oh, wait, before I talk about that, I just wanted to show you some of the effects of frost wedging. Notice the rocks down here look a little bit solid. The rocks up here well, look a little more jumbly and broken apart. And part of that, not the only thing, but part of that is frost wedging. 
Now, very similar to frost wedging is salt wedging, except in this case, instead of a crystal of water growing in, in a rock, uh, in a little opening in the rock, we have a salt crystal uh, growing. And so as this salt crystal grows, it's going to exert a force on the rock and slowly start breaking it apart. Now this is going to be most effective in coastal areas where you get some salt spray from the ocean landing on the rocks and evaporating. It's also common in arid areas. And that's because in these two places you get the salt water or water on things. The water evaporates and anytime water evaporates, whatever is in that water dissolved gets left behind. So in these arid areas, water is evaporating and then just the salt that's dissolved in the water will, um, will precipitate and it'll start uh, breaking apart the rocks. And this is Petra and Jordan. And notice up here these rocks look like they should be flat, but they've kind of got some holes in there. Uh, if we zoom in, look a lot like that. Much of that is caused by salt wedging. As those salt crystals grow, they'll break uh, little sand grains out of the rock, eventually creating these types of structures. Another type of mechanical weathering is known as pressure release. Pressure release is also called unloading. And this doesn't occur in all rocks, but it does occur in intrusive igneous rocks. And remember from our last lecture, intrusive igneous rocks are some of the ones that form deep, deep, deep underground. Okay? And they might form, you know, 40 kilometers underground. So there's a lot of pressure on that rock when it forms, right? Here's this deep pluton, lots of pressure pushing down on it. But over time, all of this rock that's burying that gets eroded away. So now this rock is no longer under that much pressure. And since there's no pressure forcing it to stay together, it actually starts expanding a little bit. I always say this is kind of like uh, when you buy an onion and you're cooking and you, you know, you buy it and it's all nice and stuck together, but you take that outermost skin off and it kind of starts expanding a little because there's no longer that pressure holding it together. Same thing happens in this. We get these things called sheet joints developing. And a sheet joint, well, anytime we talk about a joint in rocks, that simply means a crack develops. And so in these, these plutons that originally formed deep, deep underground, these joints develop and these cracks, basically, and then pieces of that rock will, uh, will slowly fall off. And that's what we're seeing right here. This is the Pikes Peak granite that was originally formed deep underground. Now it's at the surface. And look at these cracks developing as that rock expands. We can also see that at Independence Rock in um, uh, Wyoming. Right here, there's a nice big crack, and eventually this whole big piece of rock is going to fall off of there. Just to give you an idea of size, that's some dude climbing up there. Um, you can see things like this also if you travel west from here and go to Enchanted Rock. You'll see some of these sheet joints developing in Enchanted Rock and um, eventually, you know, pieces will actually break off. Now these rounded structures that are formed from this unloading, uh, this pressure release, these are called exfoliation domes. A less common uh, mechanical weathering process is something called thermal expansion. And thermal expansion happens because when you heat things, um, any substances, they expand. When you cool them down, they contract. If you cause this heating and cooling to happen fast enough, cracks will develop. And this can be associated with forest fires where you had a very hot fire going across an area and then either a rainstorm right after it or water being dropped, it can cool it quickly enough to crack things. This can also occur in deserts. Deserts have, um, in many deserts, you have very hot daytime temperatures but very cold nighttime temperatures. And these sudden changes can uh, cause cracking to develop in the rocks. Now, last but not least, 
biologic activity can break apart rocks. The activity of plants and animals. You can have animals burrowing into an area and kind of breaking things apart, or you can have the roots of a plant growing in somewhere and uh, breaking a rock apart. And of course you can have human activity as well. This is a nice um, image of root wedging. Notice we have one side of a rock here, another side right there, and there's this tree growing in there. Well, how did that happen? You know, a seed initially fell on a tiny crack in that rock, and the seed germinated, and it's been growing as a tree, and as it grew bigger and bigger, its root eventually split apart that uh, rock. The same thing here. Above this rock, there's a pine tree, and right there is its root where it split that rock apart as it was growing. So we can mechanically weather a number of different ways. And basically the rock is simply going from bigger pieces to smaller pieces. But I don't want you guys thinking that mechanical weathering and chemical weathering is like an either or, like either you have this or you have that. In fact, in nature, both are always working together to break apart the rocks. At the same time mechanical weathering is occurring, chemical weathering is also occurring. Now, depending on the environment, you might have more of one over the other, but still, the, the two things work together to break apart rocks. And one way we can see mechanical weathering helping chemical weathering is because mechanical weathering increases surface area. So what we have here, we have this initial cube of rock and surface area is the area exposed. Well, if we just get these three cracks in it, now, look, we've got those surfaces inside that used to be hidden inside the rock are now exposed. Well, why is this important? Because chemical weathering can only occur on exposed surface area. So, if mechanical weathering cracks a rock and we now expose more surfaces, that means then that uh, there are more places where chemical weathering can occur. So let's look at what happens in chemical weathering. There's a few different types that can occur. One type is called dissolution. And this is where the entire mineral dissolves in water and there is no residue left behind. Well, um, you guys already know about this. Let's take a, a mineral called halite, which you better know as rock salt. And if you take some salt and you pour it in some water and you stir the water up, the salt looks like it disappears. That's dissolution. Well, there are very few rocks that will be like halite, salt, and dissolve completely in water. But in nature, water is not pure, right? Most minerals do not dissolve in pure water, but in nature, water is often just slightly acidic. And that's because we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And a little bit of that carbon dioxide dissolves in water and creates a very, very weak acid. It's called carbonic acid. And a lot more minerals are uh, soluble in this carbonic acid than would be in absolutely pure water. And so because we have this very slightly acidic groundwater, we can get things like caves. Uh, this is Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, and this is made out of, uh, there's a rock called limestone, and um, limestone's made of the mineral calcite. And you should remember from the mineral lab Remember you put a little bit of acid on calcite and you see all the bubbles forming? Well, that's because it is reacting to the acid. It is dissolving. So what can happen is you have a little bit of acidic groundwater flowing through an area of limestone bedrock and it will start dissolving away that bedrock and creating these huge open areas underground. And these were once rock 
once this whole area here was was rock with just the little tiny cracks in it but that water flowed along those little tiny cracks dissolving more and more rock making bigger open spaces underground creating these caves well that's dissolution the entire mineral dissolves and leaves nothing behind no residue behind well there are other types of chemical reactions that act on uh, rocks and minerals. Another one is called oxidation. And oxidation is a reaction in which an element loses electrons. And so it has to do with this chemical reaction where during the reaction, a certain element gives up some electrons to another one. And uh, it's called oxidation because it most commonly occurs when there's a reaction involving oxygen. And this affects iron bearing minerals. Basically, it's rust. So what we see here, hopefully you'll notice that there are some of these kind of reddish orange areas in the middle of those black rocks. These black rocks are basalt. And remember from the last lecture, basalt is mafic. Mafic meaning it has lots of iron and magnesium in it. Well, what happened here was this part of the basalt was exposed on Earth's surface for a long time where it interacted with water and it interacted with oxygen from the atmosphere and some of that iron in the basalt rusted, creating this kind of red-orange layer. Now, to give you the whole story behind this, this is on the Isle of Skye on the, uh, off the west coast of Scotland. And um, these, uh, these lava flows were created back uh, basically in the, the days of the dinosaurs. And a lava flow flowed out and it sat there for a long time and the top of it oxidized. Then another lava flow covered that and it sat there for a while and it oxidized. And then another one came over that and covered that one up. And so these were the tops of lava flows that were exposed for significant amounts of time. Now, being Scotland, there's lots of sheep, so notice the sheep looking and watching me and what I'm doing. All right, so that's oxidation. Now, another type of uh, chemical weathering that can occur is hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is a chemical reaction where water is involved. You, act, you actually absolutely need water because it's part of the chemical reaction. Um, it's, it's in the chemical equation. I'm not gonna write down this whole big long chemical equation of how hydrolysis works, but it's very important to remember it affects silicate minerals. And silicates are the most abundant mineral on Earth's surface. So this is gonna be the type of chemical weathering that affects most of the minerals on Earth's surface. So what happens in hydrolysis is a silicate mineral will react with water, and you know that water is a little bit acidic, and uh, there'll be a chemical reaction, and the results, the result of, of hydrolysis is a clay mineral will form. A clay mineral is um, it's, uh, something like kaolinite or bentonite, or it's a group of minerals that result from this chemical weathering at Earth's surface. And um, so you get a clay mineral, and then you get a whole bunch of ions being washed away in, uh, in solution. And so you can have something like a feldspar, something in a typical granite that through chemical weathering will ultimately get turned into this kind of ugly powdery white clay mineral. Um, so it doesn't happen real qu quick, but it does happen eventually. So anyway, the results of mechanical and chemical weathering. Well, here we have nice solid granite and then look at this area here. That's all being weathered, both mechanically and chemically. So if you go up to it, it just looks like these little bits and pieces. So basically, you have um, uh, rock that was this really nice solid rock through frost wedging and, uh, and unloading and hydrolysis turns into these little gravelly bits and pieces.